Hello, everyone. Can we get you to come grab a seat so we can get the program started? Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Like I was just saying a few minutes ago, I kind of hate to disrupt all this conversation. It's really amazing and lovely, but we're going to get started. So, uh, I want to introduce a lovely soul. Yes, exactly. This is Sahan. Sahan works here at uh, SEI and uh, is going to give, uh, welcome you all to the space and actually give you a little bit more information about what SEI does. Thank you, Stacy. And I feel like I'm like standing right over the top of all y'all, so I'm going to go behind these chairs. But welcome again. We appreciate all of you being here. And again, my name is Saham McKelvey. I'm one of our directors here at SCI Soap Enhancement Inc. and love the work we do and would love to be able to give you all a little bit of a snapshot of some of how we operate at SCI. And the first thing I'm going to do to do that is welcome all of us to practice together our standard number one. I'm going to tell you what that is in a minute, but first I'm going to give you some ground rules. We've been doing that for a while, so I don't want to get carried away. I'm going to give you about 127.3 seconds to practice our SEI standard number one. So standard number one is at SEI, we greet each other every day with a smile and a handshake to strengthen the relationship between us. And every time we have a meeting or a gathering at SEI, we start that meeting or gathering by practicing standard number one together. So that's part of who we are here, part of what we do, and want to invite all of us to do that. I don't remember how much time I gave you, 100 and something, point two, something like that. But not too long, and greet someone who you were not already in conversation with for the last 20 minutes. But let's practice standard number one, and we'll come back and, and say a little bit more about what we do at SCI. to strengthen the relationships that we have between us. And that is the primary thing that is the heart of everything we believe at SEI, that relationships will strengthen whatever we are able to do between us. And the more we are able to engage in relationship, the more productive we are able to be in facing any barrier, any obstacle, any challenge. And Homelessness is one of those barriers, one of those obstacles, one of those challenges that I believe and we believe at SEI that we can best meet by developing quality relationships. Quality relationships with populations who are experiencing circumstances that lead to potential homelessness. Quality relationships with us among each other. Quality relationships throughout our community that allow us to look at these kind of obstacles, these kind of circumstances, and these kind of barriers in a way that lets us know we don't have to overcome this by ourselves. We are part of a relational community that can work together to overcome these kind of barriers and these kind of obstacles with a collective impact that can get something productive done. And one of the things that is, gets in the way of that a lot of time is 
our confidence, our belief, our belief in what we have the power to be able to do, what we have the power to be able to achieve. And alone, what we have the power to be able to do doesn't often feel like it's that much. But it is almost always a lot more than we think it is. And collectively, it is exponentially more than what we often think it is. So I wanna do something that just illustrates what I'm talking about with regards to confidence that we have in ourselves. So I am going to ask all of us to answer five questions. We're gonna ask five questions individually, one at a time. Each question, if, if the answer for you is affirmative, I want you to either stand up or just raise your hand, just one of the two. I might, I might not, but there is the possibility if you answer affirmative, then you might be asked to demonstrate that, but it might not. So, I mean, I don't want anybody to worry about it. Just, just be honest, answer how you really feel. So five questions. Question number one, how many people in here can draw? A few, all right. I mean, I might have some blank canvas in the back. We'll see. Maybe, like I said, maybe not. How many people in here can sing? <laughs> How many people in here can dance? All right, a little bit more. There we go. Lively crew. How many people in here look good? Come on, there we go. That's what I'm talking about. A stand up for that one. Last question. How many people in here believe in your heart that you are smarter than either the person on your right or the person on your left? I mean, either one. You don't even got to tell them which one it is. They don't even know which one you're talking about. Not very many hands on that one. I mean, that tells us that we feel really good about the collective wisdom of everyone else besides ourselves in this room. So I had a friend of mine, um, Dion Jordan, that I first heard ask those questions with. Dion is a motivational speaker who has traveled all across the country doing motivational talks about encouraging people to fill their cups, encouraging people to build their confidence, encouraging people to step out and do things they might not believe they're capable of doing. And he has talked with one percenter CEOs. He has talked with kids in kindergarten and low income schools and everything in between. So Dion does this talk and he asks those same questions. It's without fail, every time I ask adults these questions, I get a very small sample smattering of hands raised, very few standing up. Like we got one stand up today, I was, I was happy. Very few, and why is that? Like, I didn't ask if you could draw well, or sing well, or dance well, or I mean, looking good, that's a state of how you feel about yourself. And, and without fail, every time he asks these questions of a group of kids, say like six, seven, or under, every single one of them raises their hand. You go talk to some kindergartners and ask them if they can draw, they will start writing on the back of the shirt of the kid in front of them <laughs> to prove that they can draw. Ask can they dance, they will get up in their seat and start dancing on the spot. They all think they look good. They all think they're smarter than their peers and you. <laughs> so what is happening to us between the time we're in kindergarten and the time we're adults that eliminates that confidence? And there's a lot of things, school is one of them, but a lot of us participate in various systems that contribute to what in the world happens. I would say one of the biggest things that we learn is fear. A lot of the reason why people didn't raise their hand is because I don't want to go up there 
and dance in front of everybody, and I don't want to go up there and sing in front of everybody. I don't want them to think that I think I look good, and I don't want them to think that I think I'm smarter than them. And fear is what keeps us from doing so much. There's so much we could do, so much we could accomplish, so many barriers we could overcome if we're able to remove that fear. If we are able to operate and live our lives with the kindergarten confidence that we used to have without any fear of anything, we could do so much more. And tonight we're gonna hear about some big things, some things that could be scary, some things that could cause legitimate fear, some things that feel like they can't be conquered. They can't be overcome. This is not something we can fix, but we can. And I know that when we were kindergartners, we all believed we could. And I want us to be able to have that kindergarten confidence back. And again, I'm supposed to be talking about what we do at SEI, but that is a big piece of what we do at SEI. It's through the power of relationships, using that to rebuild hope, rebuild confidence, rebuild that element of yes I can that our systems all of our systems rob us of and so we want to be able to get that back and we want tonight to be part of an experience that helps all of us to operate that way so welcome again um, I guess I should say some housekeeping stuff like where bathrooms are bathrooms are out in the atrium go to my left when you're walking out, it will also be your left, and then bathrooms will be on your right, about halfway down the hall. Um, if there's any other questions about space needs, facility needs, I'll be around. Please just let me know. But I want you all to feel welcome in our space tonight and want this to be a great evening. So thank you all for being here. I can't believe I have to follow you. <laughs> All right, well, welcome to our special Tuesday night forum. I'm Nikki Nowak, I'm the producer for tonight's forum. And it's my pleasure to tell you a little bit about City Club and introduce you to our program. You've already heard about self-enhancement, that was awesome. Um, I do want to mention that our radio audi audience is listening on X-Ray, FM stations 107.1 FM and 91.1 FM. And we will have a video of this forum that will be posted tomorrow via our YouTube channel. A little background about City Club, it was founded in 1916 by a group of young leaders who felt the city was not responding to the needs of everyday people. More than a century later, we're bringing together a diverse community to spark change across our region. Through trusted research, open dialogue, and advocacy for our best ideas, City Club is working to make Oregon a place where everyone can thrive. To be effective in this work, we know that City Club must be inclusive, ensuring that everyone is welcomed, heard, and respected. We must be independent, coming to the table without a preconceived agenda or a partisan bias. And we must be committed to courageous and intentional action to create change where change is needed. And to all the members here today, thank you for helping us live these values as we continue to work towards a more equitable Oregon. And to those of you who are not members, this is a great time to join. And you can see one of our staff members in the back and talk to them about joining City Club. Um, so we are inviting a diverse community of people to find out what's possible when we truly make space for everyone to connect, share ideas, and build for the future. So no matter what neighborhood you live in or what you do for a living, there's a place here for you at City Club. And just a quick mention of some upcoming events to put on your calendars. Tomorrow evening at 5.30, we'll host our annual meeting at the Airbnb offices in Old Town, Portland. And this event will be a chance to get to know newest members of our Board of Governors, celebrate a few outstanding member contributions over the past year, and network with City Club community. We'll have food and drinks at no charge. Then on Friday, Friday June 28th, We'll discuss where higher education fits in the state's budget. Are college students, faculty, and staff getting the support they need from Salem? Former State Representative Ben Cannon, who currently serves as Executive Director of the Higher Education Coordinating Commission, will sit down for a conversation with Mark Mitsui, President of Portland Community College. 
There will be no Friday Forum during the week of July 4th, but on July 12th, we'll discuss how local governments are rethinking their civic engagement models and why these changes are happening now. July 19th, we'll wrap us up our series on Oregon's budget challenges with a post-legislative session recap that focuses on how the Oregon legislature approached school funding, PERS, and more. We'll also use this opportunity to look ahead at what's needed to stabilize future state budgets. And for our final forum of the season, please join us on July 26th for a discussion of the, green, the new Green Deal and to reserve tickets, just go to pdxclub.org slash calendar. And as always, near the end of today's program, we'll have a moderated Q&A session. Anyone in the room may write a question on a note card, and when your question is ready, hold up the card, and somebody will come by and collect it from you. City Club members are also welcome to ask a question at the microphone. Just raise your hand, and we'll be passing around one of these mics. And for those of you who tweet, follow along, join the conversation, ask question using hashtag PDXConnects. And now I'd like to introduce you to our program. So would everybody please come up and take a seat. Um, tonight you'll hear stories from people who have survived without a home and are now persevering through the system and advocating for better solutions and services. We're also fortunate to have service providers with us who've seen firsthand how supportive services can make a difference in the lives of homeless Portlanders. Joining us are Stacy Bork, the Senior Director of Programs at Transition Projects, a nonprofit that helps people transition from homelessness to, a, to housing in the Portland metro area. Jennifer Langston, a state, a state certified mentor specifically trained to work with the houseless community. Ray Scuchillas is on the board of directors for Outside In and is a care coordinator with House Call Providers, which offers home-based medical care to more than 2,300 chronically ill and homebound individuals through the Portland metro area. And we have Rachel Salataroff, the executive director of Central City Concern. She previously served as Central City's chief medical officer, providing a medical direction for all of its programs. And moderating today's discussion is Shannon Singleton, the Executive Director of JOIN, a nonprofit that supports the efforts of individuals and families experiencing homelessness to transition into permanent housing. And with that, I will turn it over to Shannon. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to start with uh, just a few brief comments from folks up here on the panel. Um, and first up is Stacy Bork. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm Stacey Bork, the Senior Director of Programs with Transition Projects. And Transition Projects is a housing and homeless service organization. And this year we're celebrating our 50th year of service in this community. We serve about 10,000 people each year. We help about 7,000 people meet their basic needs, access hygiene services, mail, laundry, haircuts in our resource center every year. And this year will help more than a thousand people end their homelessness and move back into permanent housing. We also have the opportunity and the responsibility of helping about 700 people find safe, secure housing or shelter uh, each night. Shelter does not end someone's homelessness, but for many in this housing market, it's a part of their journey back into housing. That journey looks and feels different for everyone who will sleep outside or in a shelter bed tonight. I think one thing that's true today and has been true for a while is that it's taking a long time to get back into housing. So the stakes are higher once you've regained that housing. And it's critical that once someone finds a home that they have the support and services they want and need to keep it. Some people need and want very little move-in assistance and a basic setup in their new home. They just need a little help getting in. Many people need and want a bit more support and subsidy to be able to feel and be confident in holding on to their housing. This isn't permanent supportive housing, but a shorter subsidy and a mid-range offering of services, 
like a deeper connection to job support so they can find better employment. And some people want and need a deep subsidy and a high level of wraparound services to sustain their housing. This is permanent supportive housing. And for many, this means consistent, reliable, and requested services that are offered and not prescribed. I'm reminded of one woman who stayed in shelter for months. For a long time, the people in her life that she was closest with continued to die. The people who provided her support and encouragement. She could not move forward. She worked hard over months to find housing, and once she was housed, she wasn't sure she could do much else. She felt like that was it for her. But she made a plan with her peer health navigator like a dozen times to go to a grief support group. And finally, one night they went. And then they went again, and then they went again, and then they went again, and then she said, I'm going to go alone this time. And she went. And she continues to go. She continues to engage with her health providers. And she's kept her housing for nearly a year. And that is incredible success for her. For many people, having someone to walk alongside them who can relate, support them with deep empathy, and offer some nudging without judgment, and just show up for them is crucial. And it certainly is for the woman I just told you about. I'm so thankful to be sitting beside someone tonight who can speak to the power of peer support and has incredible wisdom to offer about her journey and the work that she does, Jennifer Langston. Thank you, Stacy. Hello, <clears throat> can you guys hear me okay? Yes. All right, thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is Jennifer and I never thought I would ever face homelessness. I looked at homelessness in an abstract way I thought if I can't get housed, I'll move somewhere warm where no one knows me and I'll hide my shame. I'm hoping after hearing my story, you will remember my trauma and know those trying to survive on our streets have similar experiences. My story is their story, their story is my story, and our story is your story. I got pregnant when I was 17 and the father and I were married after he joined the Navy. When I was 20 and my husband was away at sea in Asia, I was sexually assaulted by a school police officer at my high school during a Hollywood movie production. I did not want to report this assault because I knew the victim is always blamed, but I was persuaded to report it. Once I did, I was shamed and blamed by my city, community, family, and friends. This trauma led to the dissolution of my marriage, my inability to trust anyone, and a fear of asking for help when I really needed it. After the sexual assault, I was connected to crime victims for services like counseling and help with medical costs from the crime. Though my family was not understanding with the dynamics of sexual assault, they were able to provide a roof over mine and my child's head. I learned to bury this trauma deep inside of me. I became a single mother and had a career as a production manager for an embroidery company. I felt like life was going along smoothly until two things happened. First, the 9-11 attacks that traumatized and still traumatize our nation today happened. The 9-11 tragedy took a toll on my job industry due to shipping issues, which led to the cutting of my hours at work. The second thing that occurred is I fell downstairs, injuring my back at home, not at work. And like that, my life was over as I knew it. I lost my job, my health insurance, another relationship. I ended up with an eviction on my record, along with a DUI because of my poor coping skills. I eventually rented a house with friends. There, two armed men broke into our home while we slept and my roommate was injured by gun. Again, my life was disrupted. This time I couldn't get help from crime victims because I owed fines for my DUI. My brain was not functioning in a logical way. My trauma brain allowed me to get pregnant thinking it would help me regain stability. I came to my senses and elected to give my baby up for adoption. Trauma brain can cloud judgment very much like addiction does. At 33, I was feeling very lost and broken, but still determined. I was able to finish my associate's degree from Portland Community College. This accomplishment helped rebuild my self-worth and purpose in the world. Things seemed to be back on track. Then death struck. I lost 10 people from December 2010 to August 2012. This was a major trauma because it wiped out huge chunks of my vital support network. Without a support network, what do you do when life throws death divorce, health issues, job loss, loss of health insurance, rent increases, eviction, 
DUI, gentrification, and finally domestic violence. All of that led me to seek aid from TPI after my boyfriend shot me in the chest. My family had sold homes due to the deaths. A lot of my friends had died, moved away, or were already doubled up because of soaring rents. I had no idea how to navigate the housing market in my own city with my trauma brain, nor did I understand how shelters really worked. My domestic violence advocate connected me to 211. I called 211 and that service was informative and sympathetic to my dire situation. I was told to call a phone number every week to keep my name on a list for a shelter bed. I started calling at the end of May and by the end of August, my bed became available. That wait was way too long. In the wait for a shelter bed, the last of my support network evaporated due to the trauma of my boyfriend shooting me. More shame and blame. Luckily for me, TPI had a bed and services to pick up where my support network was and is lacking today. While in the shelter, I was given structure, stability, case management, and links to vital services. I took close classes about our housing structure so I could navigate, navigate the housing market. I took a rent well class so I knew my rights and responsibilities as a tenant and where to go for help when dealing with a difficult landlord. While living in the shelter, TPI also provided peer support, supportive groups like mindfulness, tai chi, and cooking to help with healthy coping skills. After TPI helped me move into my own, own apartment, they continued to support me with case management and the retention program. Monthly, I met with a case manager and attended one of TPI's groups. The retention program was very helpful to me for it helped me stay on track after I was housed. That is how I and others like me end up facing homelessness due to trauma. TPI services save lives and are so vital to our community. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Next we have Ray Scuchillis, who is gonna share a little bit about her story. Hi. <laughs> um, so my name is Ray. Uh, I'm transgender, I use they, them pronouns. Um, and when I was getting clean, I was still out on the streets. Um, I was without stable housing and I told myself, if I can get through this, Someday I can share my story and maybe I can help somebody else too. And today for the first time I get to do that. Yeah. I'm sorry if I get really emotional. Um, so by the time I was 15, I had already left my home. Uh, this was a result of some undiagnosed mental health issues and a severe meth addiction. Um, I turned to drugs as a way to cope with the fact that I didn't know what was happening in my own brain. Why wasn't I the same? Why wasn't I like other kids my age? Why couldn't I focus in school? Why couldn't I keep friends? Um, you know, things that you don't really know how to deal with at such a young age. I had already been acting out for years and I had difficulty maintaining relationships with my peers and I wasn't able to hold down a job for more than three months at a time. Uh, even though I was sleeping wherever I could find shelter, like in pool chairs or in a parking lot, parks, backs of cars, um, I still worked full time, which is a common misconception that people have about the houses community. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that everybody knows that a lot of these people that are out there facing it wake up at six o'clock in the morning, they go to the nearest bathroom, they wash their hair in a sink and they go to work. I dropped out of high school by the time I was 16, and I didn't think that I would have much of a future ahead of me. I struggled with my housing and my job, insecur uh, job insecurity until my mid-20s. It was at that time, when I was 22, that I had hit my lowest point. I had lost my job, I was close to losing my housing again, and most of my friends had abandoned me. I fell into a deep depression, and it was then that I decided to take my own life. I had written my letters to my family and friends, and I was ready to say goodbye. But then somebody took me to outside in. I remember I was in that appointment for two hours. I was met by a behavioral health counselor, a physician, medical assistant, and a whole team of people that would not let me leave while I was still in crisis. These people saw that I needed help, and they refused to let me go without it. Sorry, I can't read my notes now. <laughs> uh, they took the time.
time to listen to me there, which was a thing that I did not believe that I had deserved. Um, I was also connected with the youth services department at Outside In. Um, it was there that I met Heather Brown, who's here tonight. Um, she wrote a letter to the federal government to help get me into school so that I could get an education and have a real shot at being able to get a job that I could hold down and keep a roof over my head. Thanks, Heather. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was about to start using my notes. Um, so through getting the funding to go to college and the assistance with my mental health issues through behavioral health with integrated primary care at Outside In, I was finally able um, to go to school and I got a job as a medical assistant. I had gotten on medication, which was something that I was very resistant to doing um, because I didn't want to accept that there was something wrong with me and I knew that I would be stigmatized as a result of it. But I didn't let that get me down and I had started to build relationships. I was able to keep down a job and finally for the first time, I had caused, all the pain that I had caused my family had started to heal. Without all of those services, um, I would not be here today. And I don't mean sitting in this chair in front of you, I mean here on this earth. These services gave me a life, one that has blossomed into something that I never thought imaginable and that is successful. Um, I don't measure success by the dollar on the paycheck. I measure it in the riches that I am found by here today getting to speak with you and getting to share this story. I currently work as a care coordinator for house call providers um, and I assist, in, assist Portland's homebound population as well as serving on the board of directors of Outside In. It's there that I'm able to lend my voice as a transgender uh, individual and somebody with lived experience to help share and essentially help people realize that there, there's so much going on under the surface that we may not realize. Um, for some, the access to these resources doesn't come in time. In a perfect world, integrated mental health and primary care services like those offered at Outside In would be available at all health centers. We need a lot more visibility and community support to end the houses crisis. If I would have known or accessed these services sooner, I may have been able to uh, been have afforded to come out as transgender in my life sooner. Um, when my basic needs weren't being met, I wasn't allowed the time to analyze what those feelings that I had had since childhood were. Now that I've been able to finally come into my own, it's become very important for me to give back. I want to lend a voice to the voiceless and help educate those who have been lucky enough not to struggle like myself and so many current and former houses individuals have. I think with compassion and empathy, we can build up our community. Without these, people will never see their full potential. It's up to us to heal this community, one shelter, one health center, and one act of kindness at a time. Thank you. Before I pass it over to you, Rachel, I just want to appreciate the vulnerability and the courage that it takes to share your stories and appreciate both of you for that. Um, and Rachel will be up next. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> so we really wanted to, um, well, I'll, I'll try to keep my remarks brief because, again, I think that um, for my own experience, my best mentors and teachers have been um, people like Jennifer and Ray, who have really sort of taught us, I'm in the health profession by training, sort of taught us um, what's needed and have role modeled that kind of, um, yeah, that kind of courage and also that kind of deep caretaking of others. So, um, uh, I, I am, uh, I am the CEO at Central City Concern, um, which is a, an organization like, like TPI here in Portland, whose mission is to provide comprehensive solutions to ending homelessness. And it is an aspirational, but not an impossible goal. Um, to that end, we uh, divide our work into four areas in housing, healthcare, employment, and then sort of the secret sauce, which is social connectedness, which we've heard a lot about today. Um, 
we own or manage about 2,200 units of housing in the metro area, serving about 3,500 people a year. And our health services, we learn a lot from outside in, our close partners with them, um, are inclusive of primary care and mental health and addiction services as well. And then kind of the unsung hero of, um, I think often of homeless services is, is employment. Um, we provide employment services to about 1,200 people per year. Um, pl people who are seeking employment, some of whom are um, <clears throat> currently homeless, some of whom are in shelter, some of whom are, are housed, um, and working with about 500 employers around the community. Um, I think the, the goal, as, you know, as everybody has said, the goal here is fulfillment of an individual's potential um, but really also long-term housing stability is part of that. And we have a good front-end solution in the metro area right now with close to a billion dollars in city and metro bonds going towards um, affordable housing, which is fantastic. And what we have learned from other communities such as New York and Los Angeles is that you need to couple that front-end solution with a host of supportive services in order to achieve that long-term goal of, of, of long-term housing stability and the fulfillment of one's potential. Um, at, at our organization, we try to think of that by really starting, you put the person at the center and you design that set of services around the needs of that individual. It's sort of different than a typical, again, I'm a physician so I can bash my own profession, that typical thing that doctors do where you hang on a sign and you say, this is what I do, if you want it, come, come see me. It's different in the services. You have to deeply understand people and craft the, the services around them. And that may be um, that those, those um, uh, specific services may be um, culturally specific services. I can tell you as a, as a white person, I, am, um, I have learned many times from my colleagues who provide culturally specific services to African Americans or to uh, our Latino population that the way I would do it, they just say, throw away the playbook, we're gonna do this in a way that reflects our culture and our history and our context. Um, you have to be sensitive to different age ranges so I'll just give you a couple of examples here just to give you a sense of, of how um, population-focused services might work. Just a few um, folks that I've known have had the privilege to walk alongside in, um, in the last several years. So I'll tell you first about a, a young woman named Tiffany, um, 20 years old, um, uh, started out using prescription pills out of her um, uh, mother's drug cabinet and then moved to snorting heroin and then used moved to injecting heroin, became homeless in her late teens, long history of trauma at home. And from a, um, from a services standpoint, she was someone who, with the support of some, well, alcohol and drug services, but really supportive housing in an environment of other people like her who were working towards recovery, peer support, and particularly employment support, was able to get a job, reconnect with her family. That stands in contrast to someone whom um, I'll call Arthur, who is 60 years old, um, has very severe emphysema or COPD, um, drinks heavily, smokes heavily with his oxygen on, and was um, was evicted from um, from his from his apartment for his inability to pay rent. He actually is married, but he and his wife couldn't afford to live together. Um, he was unable to get into where she was living um, because of his other complications, and so he chose to live in a park right across the street from her house where she could look, she could take care of him and she would come down every morning and she would give him nebulizer treatments and she would give him his medications. Um, she would change his diaper, he was fairly incapacitated. So someone like Arthur is going to have a different trajectory and need a different set of services than someone like Tiffany would. And he, um, in a similar integrated primary care environment, was able to get um, <clears throat> medical support 
we were able to help him getting into more of an assisted living situation where we could provide home visits and frankly walk with him in a place of dignity towards the end of his life. So the story I just wanted to frame up is that these, these solutions will look different um, and you really have to take the time to deeply study and deeply listen to the people who have this experience and then model, model the services around them. Thank you. And for our radio audience, this is City Club of Portland's Tuesday Night Forum. I'm Shannon Singleton, here today with Stacey Bork, Senior Program, or Senior Director of Programs at Transition Projects, a State Certified Mentor, Jennifer Langston, Ray, I already forgot. Scuchillis. Ray Scuchillis, uh, Care Coordinator at House Call, Call Providers, and Rachel Solitara from Executive Director of Central City Concern. And we're going to be shifting into some audience questions. Uh, so a reminder, um, everyone listening or watching welcome, is welcome to ask a question. Those in the audience should have index cards that you can write questions down and hold up. Um, we'll bring a microphone out for those who want to, uh, City Club members who want to ask a question directly. And I do ask that folks keep their questions to 30 seconds or less um, to make time for as many questions as we can get answered. Um, and for folks up here, please don't feel like you all have to answer each question, but um, we'll do a little microphone sharing and uh, make sure that people get to answer the ones that feel like the, the right one for you to jump in on. <laughs> I just wanted to ask, in working with the people you come across, especially for women, um, what percentage do you think have been trafficked? You know, I don't, I don't know percentage uh, specifically around uh, human trafficking, um, but what I do know is that um, many women and uh, who are sleeping outside or experiencing homelessness um, have experienced sexual assault and domestic violence while in the street. A number of people experience domestic violence and sexual uh, assault that's a precipitating factor to becoming homeless. Um, and so I, I do think that it is it is a driving factor that we continue to have to grapple with and support people as they um, as they you know, express their need and uh, want to receive services and support. I've got a question. Uh, what's the process of people that are on the street or that are houseless? Uh, what's the process of them finding out about what services are available to them? Uh, or what percentage of the people that are on the street actually don't know what services are available to them? Is it word of mouth? How does it happen? Um, one of the things that I'll say is uh, that I kind of mentioned is that there is a there isn't a whole lot of visibility about community resources that are out there. Um, most of what I've heard and seen as um, working in a medical setting is it's word of mouth. It's other vulnerable people telling other vulnerable people what's going on. Um, but I think it's up to all of us to make the decision today when we leave this room to tell one person about a community service or go research a community service and tell somebody and pass that on. Um, because if it is word of mouth, then it is our job to continue the conversation and let people know that there are resources out there. I think that's an excellent suggestion. And I think part of our opportunity around thinking about services is to think about what is an information infrastructure that connects those services so that, again, it's not up to the strong will of an individual, which is always a good thing, but just from a systems perspective, perspective what is that information infrastructure? Not only so that certainly so that people can access, you know, if there's a, forgive this idea, something like a Yelp, you know, where you actually, it's sort of real time updated, but also in a confidential way, a way that um, 
with people's permission, service providers can coordinate care and share information. I'm sure you two can speak to this extensively, but just the fragmentation of the different services alone can be um, an enormous barrier for people who are seeking them but are trying to navigate between different services and for the people who are providing that care. So I think we have also an opportunity as a community to think about what is a meaningful information infrastructure that can help um, with both access and care coordination. And I'm going to add a little bit to that um, that I think is uh, part of why we have this range, this conversation about the range of services is it's not it doesn't start at shelter it doesn't start at housing um, that what we're really looking at in the community is how do we get folks out that are mobile we have street outreach <laughs> that isn't going to cover everyone so I think it's all of these pieces that are important in information sharing. Um, and if there's not a question, I have one that I can jump into. Um, so one of the things that I heard as a theme is around this relationship piece and that connection with folks that um, either is being fostered among staff on how they provide services or that were really a, a huge component of your stories. And I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what that support looks like, right? A lot of people know what Housing First is, and we talk about getting people into housing, but it's not housing only. And what is that back end, and what is that retention, and those types of services? What was helpful? What was missing? Um, what was helpful was case management. Um, that was a huge component to me being able to uh, pull myself out of homelessness because I was not able to self-manage my own life. Um, for me, once I was housed um, into stable housing, the retention program was also very important because even though you get housed, um, you, you don't have a, a sense of community once you leave the shelter. You're kind of on your own. And so the retention program was continued case management but only once a month and then we had to attend a group um, whether it be art um, gardening a walk um, to keep our services and that helped build community with um, people that um, I had been through the shelter with in fact I am friends with one of the women that I went through the shelter with is and she and I both now um, are back in the shelters um, volunteering our time um, to help show um, the individuals that there's life after um, the trauma and after being homeless. Um, and I think it's really important um, that TPI gave us the opportunity, or I should say me, the opportunity to go through the mentor program um, so that I can go back into the shelters and um, be informed on how I'm working with people. Um, so that's my piece of that. Uh, I think for me, a big part of it um, is trauma-informed care. I don't know how many people are familiar with, with trauma-informed care, but um, just a sort of snapshot of it is you don't know what somebody's life or day was like before they encountered you. So if you think of, you know, you may be having the most terrible day in the world, you're probably not going to be acting your nicest, right? So if you treat every single person like they might be having the worst day in the world, you, chances are you're going to be able to build a lot more rapport with that person. Um, a big part of, of healthcare uh, for me, accessing those mental health resources to help give me the ability to hold down a job so that I could stay housed, was being treated with dignity and respect, not being seen as a former drug addict, not being seen as a houseless person, um, being seen as Ray. You are the person that is sitting in front of me. You are a strong person, and I know you can get through this. Let's get through this together. Um, so coming at that sort of approach, and I think that trauma-informed care goes a lot further than healthcare settings. I think that this is something that I practice in my everyday life. Um, and I make sure that when I encounter people that I'm treating them with the utmost dignity and respect. Uh, for example, I was on the bus the other day and there was a man having a mental health crisis in the middle of the Burnside Bridge. Uh, everybody was griping on the bus, but instead of sitting there and being angry that my ride was being delayed, I got off the bus and I de-escalated with that man and I, I gave him 10 seconds because that was all he needed. And, and all he wanted to talk about was if everybody thought about how I held them up today and thought about climate change, we could save the world. <laughs> Think about that. I gave him 10 seconds of my day and that's all he needed. And he was holding up 
all of the eastbound traffic on the Burnside Bridge for a really long time and everybody was really mad. Um, but think about that, you know, next time you're, you're encountering a person, just remember that. Are there any government services in the county or state or um, city that take care of the homeless population or do nonprofits work through grants and other funding to take care of them? <laughs> um, so primarily services are delivered through county, city, and state funding, but it's through nonprofits. Uh, so most of us have contracts with the county. Um, some have separate state contracts, and then there's federal dollars that tend to be um, housing subsidy. I would just add that on the healthcare side, <laughs> um, many of the health services that Ray was referring to are. Um, that's primarily federal dollars drawn down from Medicaid, um, from the Affordable Care Act. So much of the care that healthcare for the homeless um, programs have been able to provide has, has really burgeoned in the past five or eight years with the advent of the Affordable Care Act. So um, uh, the integrity of that act is instrumental to many of the, of the health services that we're describing today. Um, can you talk about uh, waiting lists? Do your organization experience waiting lists for different types of services? And where do people go when there is when they're on a waiting list? Um, can you just describe what that what that situation is like? So I think um, much of people's experience um, while they're homeless is waiting. It's waiting for a shower, it's waiting for the bathroom, it's waiting for your mail, your haircut, um, your uh, place for sleeping for the night, if it's a kind of a lineup by night shelter, you're waiting for a shelter bed like Jennifer talked about, um, and ultimately you're waiting for housing. I think folks spend a fair amount of their day trying to coordinate their day around different needs and getting their needs met and trying to move around this community um, in a way that is as effective and efficient as they can um, and have all of their belongings and trying to carry all of what happened the night before and what they're anticipating happening the next day. So um, reducing those weights and reducing the amount of kind of navigation across really big bureaucratic systems that are not necessarily designed to support people uh, is something that I think we as service providers have a responsibility uh, to do with each other, um, but also hold um, big, big systems accountable to doing the same thing alongside us to make services more accessible and more equitable for the people who need them. Recently, there was some controversy about using the jail that never got used. Um, what about if we would have been able to use that and had even counselors have offices out there? Would something like that have worked? I mean, there were showers and beds and all that stuff. So it looks like I get to take the Wapato oh. question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think there's, there's many reasons that we've moved away from the giant mass shelters that that would create and creating a different environment that is much safer um, and more easy to navigate than a 500 plus person um, type of shelter. I think that we've also in the community talked about different types and forms of spaces. So there is a, how do people access hygiene? Um, how do they access showers and other things that may not necessarily also just be attached to a facility-based shelter? Um, I also think that there's the challenge of, um, you know, really housing is the solution. And so how do we focus our resources on the housing component and then wrap the services of support around somebody? The shelter model is based in a little bit more on let's get you inside, but we're still waiting, as Stacy said, for the housing piece and, and the wraparound services. Um, so there are other models that we use for safety off the streets. That's how we've referred to these types of sites. 
Um, there's places like Dignity Village, Right to Dream 2, there's our facility-based shelter providers. So there are a lot of options for folks, and some are specific to couples or for female-identified folks. So that is a just different shelter environment than that larger mesh shelter. Hey now. <laughs> Hi, I, um, I'm Loretta Smith. I used to be a commissioner. I was very much in support of Wapato. Um, but the nice thing about Wapato was that it was on several levels. It, it wasn't a big mass shelter, you know, with 500 people. We had the ability to do, <laughs> excuse me, wraparound services and supports. And my big thing was to get people out of the elements. That was that was the big deal. So I think when we don't as if we don't have anything, if we have something like Wapato, that we can give people an alternative. I know that the you know, from services it was it was far away, but we could, you know, put services on site, do mental health services, and we still can do that. And I'm I'm really very much in support of that. But thank you. Yeah. So yes. <laughs> I didn't expect that question. <laughs> yes. And I will continue to respectfully disagree, but yes. I think part yes. of it is I appreciate um, that. <laughs> is, uh, you know, in an environment where we also have had services funding cut, it makes it hard to think that we can add services to a new site like that. Um, so I think it's, right, right. there's a lot of solutions we need to keep on our, on the table. Keep them on um, the table. Yep. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so another a question that came in is, is there anyone exploring programs that offer therapeutic uses of wilderness for people with extreme trauma, uh, either funding, government, or nonprofit? I can just say this, I'm not wilderness. Um, I know that like gardening and getting us um, outside is part of um, trauma. You know, helping with trauma. I, I do gardening um, at TPI. They had gardening classes, um, but not that I know of. It's any of the organizations. There's one place called the Venture Out Project, which is um, specifically made for like queer people to get out and kind of have an environment to share our experiences with each other and, and be in a beautiful place, sort of away from everything and away from some of the you know, discrimination and, and stuff that we face in the city. Um, but I do think that if you know any billionaires, that would be a great idea. And I would love to help out. <laughs> I have a question. There are people I have encountered who are well-placed leaders in business, and they have said that they've been a part of setting up or supporting um, uh, feeding centers and shelters and there seems to be a jaundiced view by a, many of these people that I've talked to that homeless people are sort of doing this by choice and that Portland's an easy place to get over and you can just go to Director Square and you can eat and you can it's like a really easy p place to be homeless but when I drive to Gresham to work every day and I see this guy that I can't get to who's in this island of the freeway on the Markham Bridge and he's got this whole like house and like artwork and stuff and I'm like, I mean, I think he's trying to do the best that he can do and I've seen these villages and encampments come and go and you know, only like sheriffs and people can get to these people probably safely because you can't, you're not supposed to stop off the freeway. And I, I, it's hard for me to, to put those two things together because I think that people have genuine major needs and it's probably good that they have a place that they can rely on getting a meal or maybe getting out of the elements like the commissioner said. But what do you say to people that have this thought? Because I think we're, we're getting so used to seeing these sort of Hoovervilles that I remember reading about in social studies class many years ago. It's like normal now, and people think that that's what people want and that it's easy. Does that make sense? Oh, uh, I just, uh, you made me think, and I'm sorry, Dad, I'm going to say this, but my dad and I were hanging out, and he said to me, if we stopped feeding the homeless, they would go away. 
And I was just like, wow, <laughs> no, that's not going to um, stop you know, somebody from being in need if we don't provide the services. We need to have safe spaces. One, it builds community. Two, um, people are connected to resources when they're able to go to places that are set up to feed people. Um, so I, I, like you, I, I do not see that. I, I think that without places where people can go, I think that that will just cause more crime, you know, if they don't, if we don't have places to um, provide food, shelter, hygiene, you know, I think it causes more problems. So uh, that's my feeling on it. Anybody else? Thank you. Just really quick in terms of like the art and stuff that really struck a chord with me because I used to do a lot of drawings. That was my way of making a home out of whatever environment I was in. So the reason why I say houseless is not because that's just the word that I decided to say. It's because homeless in, it like implies that people don't have homes. Your home could be a tent. Your home could be that underpass or that you know island in the middle of the freeway. You're just without a house as we conventionally see it. So a lot of people are trying to create homes wherever they can. And I think that if you encounter somebody who's trying to say, you know, they seem happy, it's because they're grasping on to whatever they can find to make them get through that day. Thank you. I have a question. And this will and be our last question tonight. Great. Thank you. And there may not be an answer, but um, in our neighborhood, there are homeless people that they come and they go, and over the last several years, I've noticed they're not the same people. And I'm wondering, do we have any idea how many homeless people there are in Portland at the present time? <laughs> when I was looking up speeches, one of the things it said that you can start off with was the statistics. <laughs> so boy, oh boy. I have a number for you on one of these pages. This one. Uh, so the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development reported in 2018 to Congress that the state of Oregon had approximately 15,000 homeless and 9,000 sheltered individuals. So, and that is a really low estimate. That's only what people are reporting. So I will say that every two years we conduct uh, what's called a point in time count um, which is a physical count of the people who sleep unsheltered that we can count, um, and then a shelter count uh, that happens every year. And so that data, uh, we did that in January of this year, and that um, will come out soon. Um, and that's, that's kind of the number that we have to report to HUD, and it's the best, well, it's the number we have to report to HUD. Um, and um, the number that we use for a lot of planning purposes um, and to see trends and different uh, emerging trends with different communities who might um, be experiencing different levels of housing disparity um, or have you know greater vulnerability on the streets and allows us to do uh, a lot of community level planning with that data. Um, well, thank you all, and um, thank you to all of our panelists and the audience for tonight. Um, I've really appreciated the conversation. Um, I think part of what is important to remember is, uh, as voters, we all got behind some recent bond measures to help develop the housing. As, as Rachel mentioned when she was speaking, um, we also now have to figure out how to look at the services. Um, and for those who are interested in continuing conversation and updates and information about services and how we're gonna fund them, um, the work of Here Together is something that you can plug into. Uh, you can text to join. You text uh, the word TOGETHER to 38404, I'm sorry. You text TOGETHER to 38470. Um, and you can stay up to date with a lot of the folks up here doing the work to move towards uh, services funding. Uh, and now we're gonna welcome back Nikki to close out our night. All right, our time is up, but we have snacks. <laughs> um, so we're grateful for everyone who made today's forum possible, um, including Outside In, Here Together, Wheelhouse Northwest, Transition Project, Central City Concern, and Bob Quillen for your guidance in develop developing this series. So thank you very much, um, Stacy, Jennifer, Ray, and Rachel for sharing your stories and insights and Shannon for guiding the conversation, and to all of you for joining us, thank you.